let's get on to airway management. Um, and this is something that you'll again have so many really good people teaching you this stuff. There's so many good courses out there. Um, again, I'm just trying to give you a really solid framework that most consultants would think of when they when you're presented with this stuff. Aim is to have a simple step by step approach, a safe approach to any airway, and then being able to communicate that effectively with your colleagues. I'm going to come a bit of the incidents so you get an idea of what this means incidents wise airway assessment like a boss plan for the known difficult airway plan for the unknown difficult airway and then all the measures you can take for these unknown difficult airways all the way up to uh, a very brief explanation of the front of neck axis or surgical axis first thing i'm going to ask you uh is this a difficult airway just have a thought now over the next five seconds and why do you think this is a difficult airway maybe verbalize it to yourselves now, I suspect most of you said, look, this, this person has a beard and that seems like it's a bad thing for airway management, which, and you'd be correct. Now, if I was to say this patient has a malum patty too, we'll go through that, what, what all of these mean. Thyromental distance of seven, mouth opening of five, jaw protrusion A, which means that's a good grade and normal neck extension. What do you think now? <clears throat> I would say on for our first like observation, you look at him and you think, oh, he looks like he's got a short neck, he's got a beard, he's going to be difficult. But then when you do your <laughs> further examination, a melon patty tooth is not too bad. Thyromental distance of seven is normal. Mouth opening of five is normal. Jaw precision is good and normal neck extension. So it's probably not going to be as bad. The only thing that might be difficult is getting a seal with the mask because of the beard, which you can navigate with like a gadal or something. Yeah, fantastic. So. I like the, the the airway rule number one, which you've addressed really well, is that airways should be assessed and managed with respect to the way you assess and manage the, the way you manage the airway. So, I assess and I, I assess it in, with respect to bag mask ventilation, laryngeal mask airway ventilation or LMA, and intubation. So these are the ways I communicate and I think about it, and that really helps me come across logically to my consultant, but also keep the patient safe. So how common is this? Uh, these are some of your, take a photo of this, just because uh, it's not in your workbooks. Um, but yeah, like these are not necessarily the most rare events, but just know that CICO, so can't intubate, can't oxygenate, is really quite rare, you know, one to three in 10,000 cases. Uh, and it often happens not because of the patient being inherently can't intubate, can't oxygenate, it's because people have done the wrong thing by persisting at a failing technique, losing sight of the environment and the situational factors, and just repeatedly attempting an intubation and therefore traumatizing the airway. So how do you assess this airway? History examination investigations is still the way I want you to, you know, if you ever get asked this, it shows perspective to give this kind of approach. So, you know, just know that past history and anesthetic charts, letters and cards of so previous anesthetic airway management is the best predictor of a difficult airway. I've put Kane did there because that was my, you know, med school mnemonic for causes of anything and it actually applies pretty well here congenital autoimmune neoplastic endocrine drug infection and trauma that's what that was one of those things uh, to think of all the kind of roundabout causes of any problem i could think of that realistically i don't need to think of it too much because they're often so obvious when the patient comes in you know to be reviewed by myself that i don't have to think about it too much but if you're giving an answer to your consultant this is a complete answer Examination is what we'll go through as well, and investigations. As often, if you need an investigation, it's a CT or MRI, nasendoscopy, or lateral neck x-ray. You'll hear a lot of different ways of doing airway assessments, and this to me is a very common sense thing, and there's a lot of mnemonics out there. But I think you can do this with far more common sense and logic. So one of the things that I'll teach time and time again is don't worry too much about the mnemonics, but just do this in a targeted way to assess each of bag mask, ventilation, LMA, and ETT, and maybe even surgical airway assessment. And we'll go through what, what, what I mean with this. So we're gonna be very, very systematic. This is almost pedantic, but it'll give you such an amazing structure. That I'm actually, I'm really glad that I get to teach you guys this from the very start. So the three axis model is something people talk about. Um, was when you think about it, oxygenating a patient is pretty much getting oxygen somehow through the mouth, past that almost right angle curve of the oropharynx, down through the trachea into the lungs. And the maths doesn't always line up necessarily. So you've got the oral axis going straight back, the pharyngeal axis at a certain incline and the tracheal axis at another incline. These don't line up. So air is difficult to get past through whatever means. You know, when you bag mask the patient, you need to essentially create positive pressure with a seal to get air flowing around that curve. And if the tongue obstructs, you can get a Goodell to make that better. If you put an LMA, you're bypassing all of that curvature and again, making that work. 
With intubation, you're trying to get a view. So you've got to make all those axes line up to get your view to finally put the tube into the right spot. So that's what they will talk about with the three axis model of intubation. So here's a diagram, which we're going to work on as we go through this exercise. Think about the predictors of difficult bag mask ventilation using this picture, just from looking at how you'd get oxygen past the mouth through the oropharynx into the trachea. What I'm doing here is I want you to think about what it takes to bag mask this patient. You need the seal, so a beard is bad. Maybe they've got lots of, you know, a lesion on there. Maybe they've got a floppy face because they're a bit elderly. Very hard to create a seal. Maybe they're edentulous. No teeth means no structure. That makes it hard to ventilate as well. Or maybe they've got something in this oropharyngeal area. OSA is you know, probably the most common thing because they've got so much soft tissue, it's hard to bag mask or they've got a tumor there, which again would be apparent because of the surgery you're doing. The final thing I think about is, you know, once you're trying to ventilate the lungs, is there a lot of obstruction or restriction to the lungs, making it harder to ventilate? Severe restrictive obstructive disease or obesity? So, you know, I'm thinking of this diagram, thinking of the anatomy every time I'm doing this. So here are my predictors, take a photo of that. But again, I'm, I'm really happy to move on from each of these because I'd like you to watch the videos and then write this down so you get a second second shot at memorizing these things. The history of past difficulty, uh, the seal is a problem with these factors, beard, no teeth, age. Oropharyngeal obstruction means there's just lots of crowding and that can be from all of these factors mentioned. And then ventilation is hard because of non-compliant lung mechanics, which is, you know, BMI is a part of that. So using that logic, same thing, just logically try to tell me now, LMA ventilation, why would that be hard? Hmm. So I guess going purely from a sort of anatomical schematic, starting at the, the lips, how, how widely can this person open their mouth? And I suppose at the teeth as well. There's a minimum it's... profile of two centimeters to insert a low profile LMA. So two centimeters is the minimum, but you know, I'd be pretty concern at two centimeters but that's great it's a mouth opening i suppose sort of moving back is there much uh, that's because it's also related with crowding at the oropharynx uh, moving back uh i suppose to the epiglottis um what's the malamparty score is you know can you clearly see the epiglottis is there crowding at the back of the mouth is this an emergency is this someone who needs uh, who is having epiglottitis or some sort of um, emergency airway absolutely um, pretty much got the main things there can i insert the lma through there is like the bag mask is there obstructive things in the oropharynx that create a problem and finally is the patient going to be difficult to ventilate so limit history of difficulty is a great predictor insertion lma placement uh, kind of obvious things that you'll probably realize straight away and then ventilation same as bag masking but even but it's slightly better because a lma provides slightly better seal potentially than a bag mask but similar things. Finally, for intubation, what do you reckon the predictors are? So take 30 seconds. Uh, think of reasons why you'd have difficulty uh, getting a laryngoscopic view and in intubating. Um, yes, yeah, so sure. So starting from the front of the mouth, um, you need enough mouth opening to get in a laryngoscope. You can have difficulty if they've got unusual anatomy mm -hmm. or prominent teeth. Mm -hmm. Going past that point, you need to be able to displace the jaw forward. So any issues with the tissue in the bottom of the mouth can cause problems with that or and with the jaw itself. I'm thinking burns and radiotherapy can cause those kind of constrictions, which is great. Or acute things like um, infections in the floor of the mouth, I guess, as well. Obst things to obstruct, I guess, can also come into that um, category. Probably that's going to be more of an issue at the level of the vocal cords and epiglottis. And that's really great. Um, so that's kind of the system I want you to go through, which is fantastic. Just logically going through what it takes. Actually, the final thing, I sorry, I didn't let you finish that. The final thing then is the ability for the neck to extend as well, which will you know not allow you to get a laryngoscopy view, whereas you might be able to place an LMA or do bag masking reasonably okay. So like you mentioned, mouth opening, overcrowding of the mouth, um, difficult view at larynx, laryngoscopy. Things like, you know, malum patty three or four just mean there's a lot of overcrowding of the mouth. Um, and then exactly laryngeal structures, edema, pathology, their stride or difficulty swallowing secretions and hoarse voice. And this is again, probably different to a lot of what you'd be taught to do because you're taught to do the examinations of mouth opening, malum patty, thyroid, mental, neck extension, jaw protrusion straight off. But I really need you to have context to then communicate back the findings, not as findings, but as, look, the findings mean that they've got a difficult, this, an easy LMA, the tube looks okay. And these are what my findings are. 
because you, then you've synthesized your information, you're adding value to your findings. From what I've just said, you know, lots of anesthetists might not teach it to you this way. So I've got to teach you the names about things we regularly talk about. So Mal and Patty score is this. It's really what the mouth looks like and the relationship of how much you can see the back of the pharynx uh, and how much of the uvula you can see. One and two show that there's not much crowding, so they're good grades. Three and four are bad grades, showing overcrowding. Uh, that's, a, that's a QR code for the Mal and Patty score on Wiki. Thyroid mental distance just means your mental prominence to your thyroid prominence. And if that's greater than six and a half centimeters, six or so six and a half centimeters, the evidence was good, uh, less than six bad and six to 6.5 equivocal. But again, different sized people would mean that, you know, you wouldn't take that number as a hard number, really. Like you definitely modify that based on the size of the patient. So that's your thyroid prominence, thyroid mental distance QR code. And then the mandibular protrusion test. So class A is your jaw, lower jaw goes in front of your top jaw. And this is a bit weird to ask patients to do, but you can get them to bite their top lip. And that's often a good way of seeing if their jaw is uh, mobile. Class B is inline. And then class C is an overbite. And that's a bad grade. And that's a code for the uh, for jaw protrusion. <clears throat> You'll often hear about the Cormac Lehane laryngoscopic grades. Again, grade one is full view of the cords. Grade two often classified as 2A and 2B. So if you can see most of the cords, 2A, if you can see just the tip of the cords at the bottom there, it's 2B. Three can often be 3A or B, again, depending on the angle of how much you can get. So a grade 3A is you just can't see the cords, but you can still get underneath. But 3B means that it really isn't at an odd angle. And then grade four means you can't see the epiglottis at all. Just things to know because that's how often you'll be communicated to uh, when you're doing airway assessments and when you're doing laryngoscopy. And that's the Cormac Lehane grade QR code for a web link. Okay, the five second airway exam. So literally you think about all those things, but this is practically what, what I do. I take a history, make sure that there's no previous indicators. I inspect for age, beard, BMI, obvious malformations, trauma, all the caned it stuff. Uh, mouth opening. With the mouth open, I ask, I look at for a Mal and Patty score, a large tongue, prominent teeth, into incisor distance or the mouth opening. And then with the mouth closed, I look for jaw protrusion, thyroid mental distance and neck extension. I do that in five seconds. And as you get more experience, you'll be able to, you know, think about all of the other pathways anatomically for good intubation to line up those three axes just with that examination. But this is literally the system I go through. So let's practice the focus airway exam on each other. Uh, while you're here, just um, turn to your partner, <laughs> turn to your buddy and just do the airway exam. Oh, the inter incisor distance is literally the, the mouth opening. So how far from the bottom of the you know, top teeth to the top of the bottom teeth, um, if that's really uh, difficult, uh, if that's really small, then everything, almost everything will be difficult.